Hey everybody, welcome to Pick Dr. Osborne's Brain. Tonight we're gonna to be talking all about the thyroid, how gluten relates to it, what kind of foods that you should avoid, what uh, nutrients are necessary for your thyroid to function. If you want a comprehensive thyroid evaluation by your doctor, what tests you can ask him to run, and so much more. So make sure you stay with me to the end. We're gonna be talking, diving in about all these different topics on the thyroid. So without further ado, let's jump in. So we'll start with some symptoms. And these, this is not an all-inclusive list, but um, many people that struggle with hypothyroidism, so if you're not even, maybe you're not even sure, but maybe you're struggling with some of these symptoms, this might be, again, paying attention, this might be something that you, um, you want to, after watching tonight's show, go, go and ask your doctor or talk with your doctor about it. So one of the biggest ones is low energy. So people with low energy or fatigue. Now, a lot of things can cause fatigue, so I don't want to scare anyone into thinking they have thyroid if, if they're struggling with low energy or fatigue, but this is a hallmark classic symptom. And this could be you know, low energy even after a full night's sleep. So you're getting plenty and ample rest, but you're still tired. You don't have your get up and go. Exercise wears you out or wipes you out. So low energy fatigue. We also see with low thyroid, we see hair loss. Now, not the same kind of hair loss as autoimmune hair loss, where we might see big numular patches of hair loss as in alopecia areata. But in essence, we'll see clumps of hair coming out. So, so basically, clumps of hair, bigger losses of hair, hair thinning are all part of low thyroid function. We'll also see dry skin. So, and again, some people are naturally have a tendency toward dry skin, um, if you're that kind of person, you may not have thyroid disease, but if your skin has always been relatively okay and then all of a sudden it starts getting really dry, you're losing hair, you're really tired, okay, this trifecta of symptoms is something you really want to pay attention to. Low libido. Um, sex drive is dramatically reduced when somebody's thyroid hormone is not functioning properly, so if you're struggling with low libido, this is another one. Constipation. Very common... Uh, because low thyroid slows down bowel function, slows down the motility of the, of the GI tract itself. So constipation is a symptom. Joint pain, and we'll include in this, kind of have it down here, muscle tightness and stiffness. But remember that your muscle, pound for pound, uses it's, it's one of the most um, energy-using organ systems or systems in your body. And when your thyroid is low, your muscles get tight, they get stiff, your joints get compressed and you can start developing pain. So it's very, very common. And then we have this, this weight loss, weight gain. So which is it, right? So some people actually gain weight when their metabolism slows down. They put on extra weight. They don't know where it's coming from. They're not eating more. They're trying to exercise, but the weight still keeps coming on. And some people with hypothyroidism actually start to lose weight. So it's kind of you know, most people are focused on this weight gain and doctors particularly are focused on weight gain. So if you're one of those that really struggles to keep the weight on, that doesn't disclude you from the potential that your thyroid might be malfunctioning. And then in addition, gut dysfunction. So we mentioned constipation, but it's also very common for people with thyroid issues to develop IBS, irritable bowel symptoms, irritable bowel syndrome. So Gut dysfunction can be quite common in those with a low thyroid as well. So if you struggle with this conglomeration, so again, remember, these are all symptoms potentially of low thyroid. Okay, we're not talking about, about hyperthyroid. If we're talking about hyperthyroid, we would, we would say bulging eyes. It's a condition known as exophthalmia. If you haven't heard of that before, let's, let's change our, our text color here so you can see it better. But um, exophthalmia, which is when the eyelids bulge out, heart palpitations. So again, some of you watching may not be struggling with hypo, you may be struggling with hyper. Okay. Exophthalmia, heart palpitations, difficult sleeping, you can't go to bed at night, jumpy or restless legs. We'll see hot flashes that can mimic menopausal-like symptoms. Okay. 
We'll see severe mood swings and irritability, shortness in your temper. Okay, we, we mentioned that mood swings, shortness in your temper. So, so these are super classic symptoms of hyperthyroid, um, heart racing or, or elevated heart rate, weight loss, not weight gain with hyper. So generally this is you can't keep the weight on. So the weight's falling off of you and you don't know why. So again, the difference here, these are symptoms of a low thyroid. Okay, these are symptoms of a hyper thyroid situation. And, and several reasons why I bring this up. We're talking about thyroid disease. You know, there's autoimmune thyroid disease, it's called Graves. And then there's autoimmune thyroid disease called Hashimoto's. And they're both autoimmune. And people, well, many people don't realize that autoimmune disease has the same underlying core fundamental causes, right? So whether you have Graves or whether you have Hashimoto's, what I'm telling you tonight, what I'm teaching you tonight applies to both scenarios. So I get the questions a lot. What about Graves? Because we've done a lot of we've done a lot of education on Hashimoto's in the past, but people come back and ask, what about Graves? What about Graves? Pay attention because everything I'm talking about tonight also applies to Graves. Now it also applies to medicine induced. So sometimes what happens is the meds you're taking for thyroid are too strong. The dose is too high. And so sometimes these symptoms are also a conglomeration of your medicine dose being too strong. And so keep that in mind because if you've been medicated and you're being medicated for your thyroid and, you're, and your ju dose just got changed and then you start struggling with some of these types of symptoms, then that's your cue to call your doctor and make sure uh, that he's on the same page with you that you're not being over medicated. So now, interestingly enough, heart palpitations are also a symptom of low thyroid. So, so this one could be on both sides of the equation, but the rest of these are pretty, pretty much um, predominantly hyperthyroidism. So again, those are your symptoms that you wanna look out for and you wanna be aware of. I wanna talk about a couple of studies um, published on thyroid. So this first one, you see here, the importance of nutritional factors and dietary management of Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Um, this, is, this was published in 2020, and so you can see in, this was a review. So in literature, there's evidence for, again, we're, we're talking about nutrients here, selenium, potassium, iodine, copper, magnesium, zinc, iron, vitamin A, vitamin C, vitamin D, and B, okay? The role of the proper level of protein intake, dietary fiber, and unsaturated fatty acids, especially omega-3, has been indicated, and we're talking about hypothyroidism, but also we're talking about hyperthyroidism because these nutrients, and I'll show you in just a minute where these nutrients fit in, but they're important and they're critical for the normal regulation of thyroid hormone metabolism. So in this case here, HT stands for Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Patients should often eliminate lactose because of intolerance and interactions with levothyroxine. So this is something we didn't mention a minute ago. Let's change our color again. Levothyroxine often has dairy in it, lactose. Levothyroxine also has corn in it. So those of you trying to follow a true gluten-free diet and, uh, and not realizing that, and maybe you're taking your levothyroxine, you're getting exposure to corn gluten on a daily basis, which can also interfere with your over coming of a thyroid problem, but dairy as well. Again, this study, because of intolerance and interactions with levothyroxine and gluten because of possible interactions of gliadin with thyroid antigen. So we know that gluten, we know that dairy can both be contributing factors and we know all these nutrient deficiencies can also play a major role in the development of thyroid disease. So. Let's shrink this back down and let's blow this one up so you can see this better. Okay, so what we've got here, multiple nutritional factors in the risk of Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Conclusions, clinicians should check patients iron, particularly in menstruating women. Why menstruating women? Because when you're menstruating, you lose iron once a month. And, and so with that loss of blood, and so when you lose that iron, there's this transition. It's like a one to 10 day period 
and I don't mean period as in cycle, but period as in period of time, where your body's trying to recover that lost blood for recovery. And so what happens to women is, is they spend a third of every month, up to a third of every month, just in iron deficiency recovery, which is impacting the way their bodies can produce, properly produce T3, which is the active form of thyroid hormone. But again, iron in menstruating women and vitamin D status to correct any deficiency. Adequate selenium intake is vital in areas of iodine deficiency and in regions of low selenium intake. Okay, so, so again, more research. This is another review study published in 2017 talking about nutrition as being very, very critical in the metabolism, the proper metabolism of thyroid hormones. So now let's, let's dive into what that looks like. So we're gonna look at how the thyroid works. So just basically kind of think of this as Thyroid Biochemistry 101 oversimplified uh, to a large degree. So what happens is in your brain, there's a, there's a gland in your brain called the pituitary gland, and its job is to produce the hormone TSH. Now, those of you who have ever gone to your doctor, oftentimes what doctors measure is they measure TSH. What is that? Thyroid stimulating hormone. That's what that stands for. And usually they'll tell you your range for TSH needs to be less than 4.5 um, is generally speaking. So if it's higher than 4.5, they're gonna call that hypothyroidism. If it's lower than um, 0.5, so this, If I'm sorry, I made a mis misspeak there. If, if it's higher than 4.5, they're gonna call that hypothyroidism. If it's lower than 0.5, they're typically gonna call that hyperthyroidism. So this is, I, the reason I even point this out, it's not that you need to memorize lab reference ranges or anything, but most doctors today in today's day and age uh, in medicine only measure TSH. They don't bother with any of the other thyroid markers. They typically, it's very common, you go and they're regulating your medicine or they're they're making the decision is they only typically measure TSH. Now, why is that important to understand? Because TSH is made by the pituitary gland and it's only one hormone and it's not thyroid hormone. It's just the hormone that stimulates the thyroid gland. So if you come back to the diagram, TSH stimulates the thyroid gland to produce T4. Now, T4 is thyroid hormone. That's what T4 is. So when you say T4, equals thyroid hormone. This is also important to understand that it's inactive. It doesn't work. It doesn't have activity, meaning it doesn't speed up your metabolism. T4 is like the car without the car keys in it. You need the car keys to start the engine. T4 has to be turned into T3. T3 is active thyroid hormone. Okay, so that's what we're referring to down here. So you've got TSH from the brain, which again is not thyroid hormone, it's thyroid stimulating hormone. Now this, this process you need, what do you need for this? Nutritionally, I, I just gave you a bunch of research that showed you there were certain nutrients that were important in thyroid hormone function. Well, magnesium was one of them. So was zinc, so was vitamin B12. So these three are required for that action by your pituitary to be able to produce TSH. And so if you don't have adequate quantities of these three nutrients, you're gonna end up having abnormalities in TSH. Something else that should be spoken, um, let's see if we got room somewhere else to write it, is your TSH can be artificially elevated. We said that if it was above 4.5, it's hypo. If it's below 0.5, it's hyper. But there's two nutrients that can impact this, and one is iodine. So if you're taking large amounts of iodine, or if you're taking large amounts of biotin, which is a B vitamin, okay, these two B vitamins can increase your TSH artificially. So it's important to know that because some of you, you may be supplementing, you go to your doctor, and you get your TSH run, and then your doctor's screaming, oh my God, I can't believe how high your TSH is. It's 18 or it's 20. Um, we need to get you on medicine right away. But they didn't know about this, and if you were supplementing with these things. So if you're going to get blood work done, it's very important that you discontinue iodine and you discontinue biotin 
for at least a solid week before going in to have your TSH evaluated. Because if you don't, you might get some artificially inflated high levels of TSH, which is going to confuse you and it's going to confuse your doctor. So again, wanted to point that out. So coming back to this, we've got TSH. Once you are capable of producing it, it will stimulate the thyroid gland to produce T4. All right. So now that we have T4, we know that T4 is thyroid hormone and it's inactive. It doesn't work. Okay. So it ha we have to convert T4 into T3. This is what's called conversion. Okay, so converting T4 to T3. Now, most thyroid hormone conversion occurs in the liver. Okay, that's why the liver's right here. So liver health becomes very important for T4 to T3 conversion. So maybe you're struggling, you know, you're an alcohol, you drink wine every night, right? And you didn't realize that that was that big a deal because your cardiologist told you that a glass of wine every night was healthy for you. But really what's happening is that wine is, 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 is inhibiting or reducing the ability for your liver to properly convert T4 to T3. Um, maybe you're, you're exposed to some other types of environmental toxins that are you know, bombarding your liver. Maybe you're on multiple medications that have to be metabolized through the liver. Perfect example, statin medicines. If you're having a medicine to lower your cholesterol called a statin, those, those drugs hinder the liver's ability. So does your average everyday Tylenol. Over-the-counter acetaminophen can actually start damaging the liver if you take it regularly enough. So your health of your liver is very important for this T4 to T3 conversion because this T3 is what activates the DNA. So the T3 talks to the DNA inside your cell. Okay, it activates it and that's what leads to an increase in your metabolic function or, or a regulation of your metabolic function. So let's back up just a minute. We said that these three nutrients, magnesium, zinc, and B12 are necessary for your brain to produce TSH, okay? But we also know that to produce T4, you can see here I've highlighted some of the big points. One of it is T4 requires iodine. Now iodine represents the four. That's four molecules of iodine. That's what T4 is, it's four molecules of iodine. And then this also requires protein, okay? Because the T, equals protein, particularly the T and T4 is tyrosine, which is an amino acid that you get by eating protein. Okay, so getting adequate protein. I get a lot of people come to see me, they're under eating, they're not eating enough calories and they're not getting adequate tyrosine from their diet. So their body struggles to produce thyroid hormone because there's not enough tyrosine as a backbone to produce T4. Get a lot of people too that don't get adequate iodine in their diet. And where do we get iodine? Predominantly we get iodine from seafood. So if it comes out of salt water, then generally it contains iodine. If it doesn't, then, then there, the iodine is not super, let's just say in our soil, our soil is not super rich in iodine in most places in the world. So getting adequate iodine really requires healthy quantities of kelp, healthy quantities of seafood uh, in the form of fish, etc. Um, so, so, and seaweed is another source of iodine, good source of dietary iodine. But T4, to put T4 together, there's a few nutrients not listed here. To make T4, it also requires vitamin C. It also requires vitamin B, particularly B2 and B3. Um, they help with the transport of iodine into the thyroid uh, into the area of the thyroid gland where this T4 is produced and vitamin C helps with that as well. So you need vitamin C, vitamin B2 to put T4 together. And then what we also have from T4 to T3 requires selenium, that conversion. There's an enzyme, it's called a deiodinase enzyme. It takes away one of the iodines so that you are left with one less iodine, that's T3. That requires selenium, but it also requires iron for that conversion. That's why we were talking about iron earlier when I've shown you those research studies. So again, these are key nutrients that play a role along this path. And then for T3 to talk to your DNA requires vitamins A and vitamin D. This ha You have to have vitamin A and vitamin D for T3 to be able to communicate to your DNA. And then the last step in this, this last step, which is that increase in metabolism, that requires omega-3 fatty acids. So these nutrients are all what I would call non-negotiable for your thyroid biochemistry. So 
How many times, it, raise your hand, okay, if you've ever been to the doctor and you were having your thyroid evaluated and they measured your TSH, but then they also measured all these other nutrients. Raise your hand uh, if that's ever happened to you. I bet you less than 1% of you probably raise your hand because this is not typical. Doctors generally don't, either they don't care or they don't understand or they don't know to measure and evaluate these different things. I think most doctors, even endocrinologists don't, because no nutrition is taught in medical school, nutritional biochemistry is not taught. I think they're just not aware of the nutrients involved in the chemical pathways of, of creating and, and maintaining healthy thyroid hormone, not just production, because you can see it's about more than production. So here is about production, B2, B3, uh, protein, tyrosine, and iodine, but pre-production, right? Magnesium, zinc, and B12. Post-production, we've got selenium and iron and vitamins A and D and omega-3. So again, it's not just about how to pr properly make thyroid hormone, it's about how to make it and how to produce it and how to metabolize and how it goes on its journey through the body, right? And how different things affect it. So all these things are important when considering how to properly analyze why a thyroid, uh, why a person might have a thyroid diagnosis. Again, whether it's Graves or whether it's Hashimoto's or whether it's just purely non-autoimmune and it's a nutritional hypothyroidism. So this is important to measure. Most doctors will never measure all that. It's, it's quite complex and complicated. And most doctors don't have time. They give you, you know, what, what is a typical doctor visit nowadays? Five minutes to see the doctor, 45 minutes to wait in line. You know, you might get 10 minutes with a nurse or a nurse practitioner or a PA, but it's pretty rare that you actually get time with a doctor. Now, I want to talk about some other things that can influence thyroid metabolism and the thyroid hormone production. Um, and one of them is gluten. So you can see here, and this, this is a multi-center study published in the American Journal of Gastroenterology, prevalence of thyroid disorders in untreated adult celiac disease patients and defective gluten withdrawal. Key here, gluten, oh, we changed the color here, gluten withdrawal. Okay, and here's the, the, the finality or the conclusion of this study. Okay, the greater frequency of thyroid disease among celiac disease patients justifies a thyroid functional assessment. In distinct cases, gluten withdrawal may single-handedly reverse the abnormality. And I've seen this be the case with a number of people that have come to see me, meaning I've seen gluten-free diets in many cases completely reverse a thyroid diagnosis just through diet change. So if you've never embarked on diet change, if you're unfamiliar, maybe you're new to the Pick Dr. Osborne's Brain Show, and you've never heard me talk about gluten, or you've never really heard anybody make an association between gluten and the thyroid. We have multiple, multiple research studies. As a matter of fact, you can go back to my blog at glutenfreesociety.org, and you can read in depth, and you can go read some of these research studies. We prepped and put all this together for you, both on Hashimoto's and on Graves' disease and the connection between a gluten-containing diet and the exacerbation or even the causation of autoimmune thyroid disease. So very, very important that you understand. I'm only showing you one study here, but it's very important that you understand there's so much more research than what we have time to get into and just to show. So thyroid, thyroid dysfunction, we absolutely are sure that thyroid dysfunction occurs as a result of gluten exposure for people with gluten sensitivity issues. So again, if you're not aware or if you, you don't know whether or not you have a gluten problem, you, what you need to probably do is get genetic testing done. That's like step one. Get a genetic test for gluten. And you can do that. Um, you ask your doctor for it if they won't do it. We offer that service on Gluten-Free Society because we realize that not everybody has doctors that want to work with them they're too busy fighting them. I don't know why, but um, anyway, genetic testing for gluten sensitivity, because this will help you confirm whether you might be one of these individuals where a gluten-free diet could potentially reverse or, or dramatically improve your, your thyroid condition. And this next diagram here, you can see this is just an overview of the influence of the gut on thyroid disease. And so the reason why I put these two slides together is remember for many people, what does gluten do? Gluten impacts the gut. And when you impact the gut, you get direct influence over thyroid hormone function. And that's what this research 
study is discussing. So kind of looking at this diagram, this again, this was published uh, in the journal Nutrients in 2020. It's called the thyroid gut axis. How does the microbiota, meaning the bacteria that live in your GI tract, influence your thyroid function? And so what we're looking at here, you can see here, um, AITD, this stands for autoimmune thyroid diseases. So that includes Hashimoto's, but it also includes Graves. You can see that dysbiosis, right, which is in your intestines. So this is dysbiosis from the intestines. This is abnormal bacteria milieu or abnormal microorganisms. So I've seen this be bacteria problems. I've also seen this be yeast problems. Okay, because remember a dysbiosis You've got more than one kind of microorganism in your GI tract, but bacteria and yeast are, are two of the predominant types. But a dysbiosis in those can increase the intestinal permeability. This is also known as leaky gut. And this is actually one of the mechanisms behind autoimmune thyroid disease is that this dysbiosis triggers a leaky gut. And now some of these proteins from the dysbiosis, some of these byproducts of bacteria and yeast can mimic your thyroid. The process is called molecular mimicry, meaning your immune system initially will attack these, these toxins leaking through your, through your gut lining into your bloodstream. Your immune system's there. Remember, 70% of your immune system is here. It's in your intestine, right behind. It's called the GALT, the gastro-associated lymphoid tissue. And if you've got things leaking through across, your immune system is there. It's poised to protect you. And so it will start attacking those things that are leaking through. Well, if those things that are leaking through mimic your gland, mimic your thyroid gland, then what you get over time, you know, multiply this out over five years, over 10 years, is you get an autoimmune response. Your own immune system starts looking at your own tissue, in this case, the thyroid gland, as a problem and starts to create antibodies to attack it. And this is what happens. This is what, one of the reasons why autoimmune thyroid disease occurs. So again, this is one pathway and this is why gluten, and there's huge relationship between celiac disease and non-celiac gluten sensitivity. They, these authors use the term NCWS, which is non-celiac wheat sensitivity. But Remember, it's deeper than just wheat as a grain. It's, it's wheat. It's, it's also rye and oats and corn and rice and millet and sorghum and teff, etc. So it's all of your grains. Um, so so non-celiac gluten sensitivity leading to autoimmune thyroid disease through this process of molecular mimicry, which is one of the reasons why supplemental probiotics can be so helpful. Because what do supplemental probiotics do? they can help combat the dysbiosis. They can help. Remember, certain probiotics prevent yeast overgrowth and certain probiotics prevent bacterial overgrowth, abnormal bacterial overgrowth. So probiotics are regulators of the GI tract directly. So they'll help regulate the milieu of the environment in your GI tract. And that's why there's a, there are research studies that show positive impact of probiotics on autoimmune thyroid dysfunction. Okay, but we also get, remember what your microbiota do. So if you've got a dysbiosis, these same microbiota, what do they do? They help produce micronutrients. Okay, remember your, your vitamins, especially your B vitamins, many of them are made in your GI tract. They're made by your healthy flora, by your good bacteria. Okay, so for example, we know good bacteria can produce B12. We know it can produce biotin. We know good bacteria can produce vitamin K and other B vitamins. And so when you are creating a dysbiosis, you run a greater risk of developing these micronutrient deficiencies. Well, what did we just spend 20 minutes on? We said that B vitamins and vitamin C, right? And we, we also mentioned things like magnesium and selenium and iron, like all these things together, these micronutrients, right? play a role in the metabolism, the proper regulation of thyroid hormone, right? So when you have a microbiotic issue going on, it contributes to micronutrient deficiencies. And one, again, there's multiple ways. One of the ways is that these bacteria can produce these micronutrients. But another way is that these bacteria also help you digest your food, okay? So when you're eating your food to try to get access to magnesium or iron, for, et cetera, those bacteria help break that food down and digest it for you so that you can get access to those micronutrients. And this, again, is why when we see low iron, low iodine, impaired thyroid hormone synthesis, 
in selenium and zinc, we see decreased conversion of T4 to T3. It's because these nutrients are necessary for that process and these microorganisms are necessary for both the production of nutrients but also the digestion of these nutrients. So key, key role, the gut, this, and this goes back to what we said in the very beginning. What are the symptoms? Oftentimes those early symptoms of hypo and hyper thyroid dysfunction are what? We said gut dysfunction, right? Irritable, if so, if you've been diagnosed with irritable bowel or inflammatory bowel, either one of those things, it's your cue in to know that you might be affecting, your thyroid might be getting affected as a result of that gut imbalance because your gut is necessary to help regulate thyroid hormone production. As we talked earlier too, we also talked about the liver and how important that is and the conversion of T4 and T3. And one of the other things I mentioned was muscle. Muscle also helps convert T4 to T3. So if you don't have muscle, if you're a couch potato, if you're not exercising, you're, you're potentially diminishing your conversion of T4 to T3 through lack of exercise. This is just one of the reasons why exercise is so important as well. There's many reasons why exercise is important, but this is just one more. Now, I want to talk about goiter because some of you have been asking, you know, what about nodules in the thyroid? Well, well, first of all, remember that thyroid nodule is a goiter. It's what it is. Okay. Now, some doctors will wait. The nodule itself is technically a smaller and they'll see it. If the doctor does an ultrasound of your thyroid, they'll see that nodule. Um, whereas a goiter, it gets so big that it becomes obvious on the outside. So a doctor examining, you could visually see that goiter in your neck. These foods here are known foods, aside from gluten, aside from dairy, because we said gluten and dairy could both impact thyroid function through molecular mimicry by creating autoimmune disease. These foods, not so much, although any food can induce an autoimmune process, but these foods are known as goitrogens, okay? And so you can see if you are struggling with a thyroid nodule, okay, you've been diagnosed with a thyroid nodule and these are staple foods in your diet in a very big way, you might wanna reevaluate the quantities of these foods that you're eating, but also you might consider cooking them because when you cook them, you reduce the goitrogenic potential of these foods. So some people will eat a lot of raw broccoli, the raw food movement really, in, in, in my experience anyway, when the raw food movement, this was a number of years ago, got really popular. My clinic was really inundated with raw foodies who were struggling with goiters and other kind of issues because they were eating too much of these and they had a lot of goitrogenic potential. So again, cooking them helps to reduce that. But again, these foods can all contribute to the formation of nodules uh, through the chemicals that they, they contain, those goitrogenic compounds. All right, I promised you tonight that I, would, that I would give you a comprehensive test list. So this is, you know, this is what you wanna take to your doctor. So you might wanna capture this, screenshot this. We'll have it available though on, on Gluten Free Society as well. We'll have this information available for you. But if you really want to get a comprehensive evaluation of how to optimize your thyroid hormone function, you can't stop shy of the classics, okay? Now that's to say the TSH, the T3, and the T4 are what are, I would consider the classics. These are the tests that are most commonly performed, okay? And most doctors will stop right there. If they test these three things, they're done. If, and, and then what they do with this information is if your, if your TSH is too high, then they'll medicate you, usually with synthetic hormone. If your T3 or T4 is too low, they'll medicate you. Now, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with thyroid medication. Some people need it. Some people have had their thyroid glands completely removed, uh, radio, radioactive iodine treatment. Um, and in which case, you know, medicine's not a bad idea and, and regulating that medicine by using these tests to help regulate it is not a bad idea either. But the problem is this is just a partial piece of the information. Again, we want more data than, than just this, T3, T4, TSH. And if you have it, your thyroid is intact, medicine 
may or may not be uh, the, the final end-all be-all solution for you. Again, this is where doing a deeper evaluation of many of these other things, I've seen it in a number of people where they were able to get off of their thyroid medicine, and I've also seen it in cases where they weren't, but they were able to lower their dose. So again, at the end of the day, maybe you'll require medicine, but maybe you won't, and may, or maybe you'll require less medicine. I, my, my advice is if, is if you have less medicine or no medicine, you're better off. Your body's functioning better. So it makes sense to look at these other things. Well, one of the things to look at is RT3. Reverse T3 is an isomer, stereometric isomer, a mirror image of T3. So it's like T3 looking at itself in, in the mirror, right? But the problem with reverse T3 is it's inactive. So if your reverse T3 values are really high, it's oftentimes a sign or a biochemical marker that your conversion, poor conversion to T3. So you're you're poorly converting T4 into active T3. So that reverse T3 can be very, very important to look at. Now, the labs, what they've done over the past three to four years is they've expanded the reference range on this particular test. So if you're asking for a reverse T3, you, you got to keep in mind the new reference range is higher than like 24. I think it's 24.1. The old reference range was 20. Okay, so they, they've, they've changed it recently, um, and in my opinion, it was a wrong move. They, they remember the way labs change the reference ranges is they generally they take the population, about 10,000 samples of the general population, and they create a new reference range to reflect those people that they just tested. But as we see, our population is getting sicker and sicker. As a matter of fact, thyroid medicine is in the top five every year of all prescribed medicines, period. Thyroid medicine is top five. In some years, it's top one. Uh, number one. And so we've got an increasing number of incidents of thyroid disease in this country. So when you have an increasing incidence, you can't use the normal population where, where that increasing incidence is prevalent to make reference range changes. And that's my opinion in that. So you really, with reverse T3, you're looking for it to be less than or under 20. You also want to do something called an iodine loading test. Now, an iodine loading test is um, it's a functional iodine evaluation. So what you're really looking at is, is, so loading test, this is urine, and you're looking you're at taking a big bolus of iodine, meaning you take about 50 milligrams of iodine, and then you collect your urine for 24 hours. And this measures how much of that 50 milligrams that you took before the test, how much of it you peed out, you urinated out. And so with an iodine loading test, um, why is it important? Because if you pee out the, the majority of the 50 milligrams of iodine, it means your body needed it. It means your body hung on to it. And, it didn't, and as long as your kidneys are functioning well, it means your body did not want to let that iodine go because it needed it. So an iodine loading test, some, some doctors will measure plasma iodine, which is, I, I don't recommend that. Plasma iodine is not that accurate. And so if you're, if you're doing plasma iodine tests, you're going to get an inaccurate. The iodine loading test is, is the gold standard if you really want to try to evaluate iodine levels. Now, as part of this, uh, there's a part two to an iodine loading test, and that's referred to as a halide test. And so what is a halide? Halides, you want to measure those, especially these two here, bromine and fluoride. Why do we want to measure these? Because these two compete with iodine. They will actually cause an iodine deficiency. And let, let me give you an example. Let's say you drink soda. Sodas are full of bromine. Okay. If you buy new clothes, they're sprayed with, with, uh, with anti-flame retardants that contain bromine in them. Um, so bromine can be something you get exposure to through your fabrics. It can be something you get exposure to through soft drinks. It also is in commonly found in pesticides. A lot of your organobromines and organofluoride are pesticides. So if you have bug guys come into your house, spraying inside your house, you can get exposure to halides in that, in that way. My advice, if you have a bug guy come into your house, you have a bug problem, it's better to put a perimeter blockade around the house than to spray inside your house because when you spray inside your house you get greater degrees of exposure to these potential halogenic uh, toxic compounds fluoride fluoride can be found in tea even tea that is not i mean tea is not necessarily contaminated with fluoride tea is just really good at pulling pulling fluoride out of the soil so if you're a heavy tea drinker two three cups a day you might be getting overexposed to fluoride 
And so that's something you want to keep in mind that, that fluoride also, you know, the obvious, the toothpaste, the mouthwash, the dental chair, the water, if you don't filter your water, it's very, very important that you don't have toxicity of these types of halides because again, they'll cause iodine deficiency, which will totally disrupt your thyroid hormone function. As far as nutritional testing, you know, you want to get all these nutrients checked, right? And more, these are just the, some of the ones that are important for thyroid hormone function, but the way to measure them accurately is through something called lymphocyte proliferation. And so I've talked about this. I talk about this all the time. Okay. Lymphocyte proliferation is the proper methodology for getting nutrition checked. And so again, that, you know, a lot of doctors want to either use, they want to use plasma or they want to use hair testing or they want to use serum testing. And I don't, those are not accurate ways. These are reflections of your last meal, not a reflection of your balance of your intracellular and uh, intracellular content. You also want to have thyroid antibody testing done. So thyroid antibody testing, many of you again, get that traditional TSH, T3, T4, and they forego any kind of antibody testing. There's Three major thyroid antibodies that, that doctors t traditionally check for. One is called thyroglobulin antibodies. Um, the other one is called TPO, thyroid peroxidase. So um, TPO, thyroglobulin antibodies. And then those, so those two are indicative of, of these, these two are indicative of Hashimoto's, which is hypothyroidism. But there's also another type of antibody called um, thyroid stimulating antibodies, TSIs. And these are different. These are an indicator for Graves disease, which is hyperthyroidism. And sometimes what happens with autoimmune thyroid is a person bounces back and forth between Hashimoto's and Graves. So maybe their original diagnosis was Graves, sometimes goes on, they get medicated, and then they develop Hashimoto's. And then when they get medicated for the Hashimoto's, they redevelop Graves. And so they kind of bounce back and forth. I've seen that be the case with a number of people. So again, those antibodies can be measured and the, why it's important sometimes to measure those because if you know you have autoimmune thyroid disease, then this next one becomes even more important and that's gluten. Okay, the number one known researched factor involved, period, in all of research for involved with autoimmune disease is gluten sensitivity. So gluten is the number one scientifically studied cause of autoimmune disease of all forms of autoimmune disease, whether it doesn't matter what autoimmune disease you're talking about, whether it's thyroid autoimmune uh, or whether it's skin autoimmune or whether it's liver autoimmune or, or whether it's muscle autoimmune, gluten is, is something that needs to be checked for. But particularly we're talking about thyroid tonight, so genetic screening for gluten sensitivity becomes very important. Then we also know that other food allergies can play a role. I, I mentioned goitrogens earlier, but other food allergies can also play a role in the development of thyroid disease. So it's important not just to stop at gluten, but to also look at responses, immune responses to other types of foods to determine how, how best to change your diet. And then chemicals. Look, there are a number of different chemicals that can create, they're, they're, they're chemicals that we know can disrupt your endocrine system. And remember your thyroid gland is part of your endocrine system. Many of these chemicals affect the thyroid. Look, we just spent the last year in masks. You know, those, 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 those medical masks that people have been wearing with the blue and they're sprayed with Teflon and inside that Teflon, you know what that primary chemical is? It's called a PFOA, a perfluoral alkyl substance. And that chemical is made with fluoride. So a lot of people have been breathing in excessive fluoride all year for fear of a virus, right? That's, that's, I've seen that a lot this year with, with fluoride testing. We've seen higher levels of fluoride in individuals as a result of potential for mask wearing. Now, this is why I, you know, I mentioned this a number of times. I don't want to get into COVID tonight. But if you're wearing masks still, wear a cloth mask. Wear a cloth mask made from organic material that where your cloth is not being sprayed with bromine based chemicals or you're not, it's not being sprayed with a Teflon type chemical to prevent, you know, water where, where there's a fluoride issue. So again, protect yourself from the exposure of those things, but there are other chemicals in our environment that we're exposed to. A lot of your pesticides we know interact with thyroid and disrupt the thyroid. They disrupt the pituitary gland in the brain. And so they can cause major endocrine problems with the production of thyroid hormone. As a matter of fact, especially if you have graves, there's been a number of research studies that show that farmers that are exposed to large quantities of pesticides and their family members who also are exposed to the farmer who's got exposure to pesticides have higher incidence of graves disease as a result of the endocrine disruption properties of many of these pesticides and herbicides. 
So chemical immune response is important to measure. Heavy metal testing, because we know certain metals can disrupt um, thyroid hormone function. We know certain metals can disrupt the way that the body is, um, is recognizing hormones and the way hormone receptors work. We also know that mold and yeast overgrowth can be a major trigger for thyroid dysfunction. So checking for this is not a bad idea. Mycotoxin testing can be very helpful as well because mold, uh, sometimes the mold grows in you. That's what we call yeast when the mold is growing inside of you. And sometimes the mold grows in your house. Okay, and it's external. And if you have external mold exposure, it produces mycotoxins. These mycotoxins can be very disruptive of the kidney. They can be very disruptive of your muscle, of your liver tissue, which affects your conversion of thyroid hormone. And we also know that gut bacteria, I just showed you research on the gut microbiome and how that plays a role with the thyroid axis being very important. So these are things that can be measured. And if you're really trying to get to the root cause of why you have a problem, they should be measured. And if your doctor's not measuring them, you know, my advice is to sit down and say, why aren't you measuring these things? And if they're, if they're not willing to have that conversation, it might be your cue to potentially have or find somebody else who's willing to do that type of testing. So that's a simple breakdown, a crash course, if you will, on thyroid hormone function. I'm going to open it up now for questions. We'll start with uh, first come, first serve here. So Angeline, what causes thyroid nodules and how to shrink them? I think I, I brought that up. A lot of your thyroid nodules, remember thyroid nodules are caused when your thyroid gland, when the cells in your thyroid gland become over enlarged because they're trying to produce thyroid hormone, but they can't, or when you're eating things that can contribute to goiter formation, like those goitrogenic foods. So um, the way that you shrink them is you figure that out, right? Goitrogenic foods are easy, but the rest of this, the rest of this right here is how you figure it out. Okay, let's see here. So um, normal TSH, normal T4, but low T3. You could have a selenium problem, you could have a zinc problem, you could have an iron problem, you could have a manganese problem. Those minerals are all important for the conversion of T4 to T3. Um, Is there a connection between thyroid dysfunction and type 2 diabetes? You know, I don't know that anybody's really researched those two in conjunction with one another, but a lot of the things, a lot of the triggers for type 2 diabetes um, are similar with as far as triggers for thyroid dysfunction. But, um, you know, if you're asking for a direct connection, does type 2 diabetes cause thyroid dysfunction or vice versa? I would say that thyroid dysfunction definitely we know increases the risk for the development of metabolic syndrome, thus leading to type 2 diabetes, but not so much type 2 diabetes necessarily being researched as a cause or causation of low thyroid. But, um, but again, low thyroid, remember, what is that? It's, it slows down your metabolism. When your metabolism is, is dysfunctional, then you can't generate energy efficiently. And when you can't generate energy efficiently, your body does what with that energy? It stores it. How does it store it? A lot of times it'll store it as visceral fat. That visceral fat makes you insulin, uh, makes you less sensitive to insulin. We want that increased metabolism, makes you less sensitive to insulin. And so when you're less sensitive to insulin, um, then what happens? Your body produces more insulin. And over time, what happens is you become less and less, uh, you, you become more, rather more and more insulin resistant. And then that leads to the development of type 2 diabetes, adult onset diabetes. So Caroline asking about our products being nut free. Um, yeah, for the most part, they, they are. I can't, the only product that I can think of off the top of my head, Caroline, that we carry that, that is nut, not nut free, it's peanut free and it's produced in a peanut free facility, um, but it has an almond flour in it. It's, it's our warrior bread, our warrior bread product. It, it has an almond flour as part of its base flour. So. But the, the other products, my general vitamins and minerals, et cetera, are not free. Um, let's see, is the iodine RDA too low at 150 micrograms? Yes, definitely. Um, that, so understand that the old RDAs, these old numbers that, that when you look at a food wrap or a food package or you read it even in a textbook, it says RDA stands for recommended daily allowance. These numbers were not based on optimal levels of nutrients. They were based on the quantity of iodine it took to take somebody with severe hypothyroidism goiter 
to not have severe disease. So it's not about an optimal level as much as it is about a level that as a bare minimum, this person can function without, you know, without major illness or disease, but it's not necessarily the optimal ingestion or rather the optimal recommendation, especially with our environments today. Chlorine is something we didn't talk about, but chlorine is also a halide. And of course your water's chlorinated, your water's also brominated and your water's also fluorinated. So the three halides are being added to your drinking water. And if you're not filtering your drinking water with reverse osmosis specifically, then you're not getting all the halide out of your water. If you're using a carbon pitcher filter, if you're using one of these other, the popular brand starts with a B that claims to take the fluoride out. I can't tell you how many hundreds of times we've seen fluoride toxicity and people in my office that, that are using those filters because they're not as effective at getting fluoride out as reverse osmosis. So RO, in my opinion, if you live in the city, if, you, if your water's treated, you need RO. If you're on a well, it's a different story, but if you're in the city, you need RO filtration if you wanna protect yourself. Can athlete's foot and premature white hair be a symptom of hypothyroidism? No, athlete's foot is fungus. Um, so, you know, again, that, that, can co that can be co-present. So you can have athlete's foot as a fungal infection and, you know, that can contribute to, uh, it's really, if you get athlete's foot, it's a sign that your immune system's not proper, properly functioning. Um, as far as premature hair being turning white, that typically low protein, low B12, low B5, low zinc, those are all nutrients, low manganese can all cause premature graying or whiteness uh, changes in the hair. Um, let's see here. So, so Mimi's asking, Doc, will you post the studies so that we can take them to our doctors to help educate them? Yes, that's what I was talking about, Mimi. Um, those studies, all that research is on, you can go to glutenfreesociety.org and, and we have full blown um, article linking to all the medical references, all of the studies that, that, that I was talking about tonight, but also even additional studies beyond those ones I talked about in tonight's presentation. So yeah, feel free to use gluten-free society as your resource and share it with your friends who also struggle or may have problem with thyroid so that again the more people we can send to doctors with more power empowerment and information the more lives we're going to be able to change let's see scroll down that left for me How much tyrosine is safe to take if we don't eat heavy protein? Um, you know, you can take 1,500 to 2,000 milligrams of tyrosine a day. Uh, it's safe. I mean, that you know, I've never seen anybody have a side effect that, it, you know, from tyrosine per se. But you do have to also remember um, that, you know, anything in any amount for people can become toxic. So, so again, I, I might start with that, but I would also encourage you to, to get with your doctor to measure your tyrosine levels as well. How would you suggest somebody with Hashimoto's already on an organic gluten-free soy-free diet help correct a chronic zinc deficiency and free copper excess after multiple years of eating high zinc containing foods and supplementing with zinc? Um, so, I mean, that question is so deep. Um, go back up just a little bit. So you, like you asked me an hour long consult question, Carrie Ann, I, I would first even challenge what you surmise might be the case. So like what you're suggesting about yourself, which is you have free copper excess because of chronic zinc supplementation. And I would argue that that may not even be the case depending on how you, how you found that information. I mean, the, 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 the biochemistry between zinc and copper and iron is, is, is very detailed. And so uh, a lot of people don't understand it well enough to be able to make that type of, of conclusion or the testing that you had done may not be able to make that type of conclusion. So I would even challenge the premise uh, of what you're saying. And, and uh, you know, again, your question, I, I wish I could be more helpful, but you need to really, I mean, the best way to get an answer to that is a consultation because it's just too in depth. Is it safe to take Armour Thyroid? Yeah, it's, it's safe to take Armour Thyroid. I mean, it's, a, it's an FDA approved medication. It, you know, the question isn't whether or not it's safe. It is safe, okay, if, if 
It doesn't contain ingredients that you react to and if you absolutely need it. But I would say, how do you know if you need it if you haven't investigated all the things that we're really talking about? So that's where you, you, know, you, get, with, you get with a good doc who's willing to go through and investigate those things first. And then you, you know, if you still need it after you've done all of this and you still find that you need some medication to support your thyroid, You've done all of what we know. Remember, what I'm sharing with you is what we don't know. And then, and there's always this in science. There's always the fundamental premise of we don't know what we don't know. And we may find out in the next five years, the next six years, that there are key elements that I taught you tonight that are that are big gaping holes in what we currently know. That may change and transform the lives of people with a thyroid problem. And that's where medicine can be helpful. So I'm not anti-medicine. I'm just anti-medicine without proper investigation and without intelligent uh, research. So Mary's, Mary's asking why her skin itches when um, the food moves to her large intestine just before a bowel movement. I would say you have a leaky gut. I would say that's why and that, and that you know your poop and other toxins from your poop are leaking into your bloodstream and they're creating a potentially histaminic-like response which is causing your skin to itch. That would be just a, a, a throw out there guess for you. What does it mean if your TSH is less than zero? So Sherry, more specific, if your TSH is less than zero, again, less than zero means it's too low. It needs to be at least at 0.5. That's, that's kind of the bottom of the barrel for TSH. And if it's lower than that, you either have hyperthyroid or your, your medicine that you're taking for your thyroid is potentially too strong. If, if you're taking thyroid medicine and your TSH is, is less than zero, um, get with your doctor, you know, have that conversation with your doctor about your dosing. Difference between free T3 versus total T3 is the total T3 and T4 are the quantities of T4 and T3 that are bound to protein in your bloodstream combined with the free T3 and T4, whereas the free T3, T4 is just, just the, the free floating hormone itself. The free floating hormone is what has the metabolic function in action. So you should get them both measured, both free and, uh, and, and total T3 and T4, but it's the, that free T3, T4 that it, it, it's very critical to look at that with a, with a discerning eye. So what's the role of reverse T3? I like that question. Reverse T3 is the breaking system um, of your thyroid. So if you, have, if you have too much T4, so if, you're, if your T4 is too high, your body is going to make more reverse T3. It's going to make also regular T3. Okay, but it's going to take some of that excessive T4 and it's going to convert it. Where you'll see a lot of times people will have high reverse T3 is if they're being over-medicated. It's a very common scenario. And, and if you're being over-medicated, so, so, so some doctors look at reverse T3 and they don't consider the fact that you might be being over-medicated. They just consider that you might be iron or selenium deficient. And so then they put you on selenium because your reverse T3 is too high. But it's always important to discern that reverse T3 is a breaking system. So it's, it's designed to take off some of the excessive T4 overproduction, but and that's if you're being over-medicated or if your body doesn't need quite as much, but it will also be produced if this is being blocked by a selenium deficiency, actually not just selenium, but selenium, iron, zinc is necessary for that, manganese is necessary for that. There's several minerals involved in that, but, but selenium is the primary one um, in that. So that's, that's why T3, reverse T3 and, and T3 are so important. Fluoride doesn't block T3 receptors. Fluoride um, competes with iodine uptake into the thyroid gland. So th fluoride displaces iodine's ability to get into your thyroid gland to be able to make T4 and T3. That's what halides do, they displace iodine. Let's see here. Can you still have dysbiosis if your micronutrient test comes back with no deficiencies? Absolutely, you can, Tracy. That's, um, that's definitely something that, that can happen. Dysbiosis can be present even in the, in the absence of, of uh, micronutrient deficiencies.
Oh, go back up. I want to see that on. So yeah, raw vegan for four and a half years prior to Hashimoto's. Wow, nodules on both sides of my thyroid. Yeah, Lacey, that's. I'm glad. I'm glad you're watching tonight because that's. Hopefully, you took that away from the show, um, and that you you understand that being raw vegan is you know cooking those vegetables can be very critical if you've got goiter or if you've got nodules, but but also protein. You you may want to look at your protein levels because you may not be getting enough being in a raw vegan type of diet. Okay, let's keep going down on the left. Let's also go down on, oh, here we go. So I said first come, first serve with the questions, but some of these questions are monster questions. Like again, it would take me an hour consult just to even scratch the surface and getting into it. So if I don't grab your question, it's not that I'm trying to ignore you. It's that, um, it's, that it's just too complex for the show. We got to keep it, you know, the kiss simple, the kiss, keep it simple principle. We got we to gotta ask kiss type questions. Uh, what does it mean if free T3 is flagged as low? It basically means that you're not producing adequate quantities of it. And that's, you know, again, you know, go back and, and think about what I talked about tonight, which is why. Why aren't you producing t enough T3? Uh, if your T4 is normal, it could be a conversion issue. If your T3, um, if your T4 is, is also low, it could just be an iodine issue. I mean, there's a number of different potential possibilities that that could be, but, um, but it's hard to say from just the one number. Let's see. Does fat toxicity impair thyroid function? Define fat toxicity. You mean being overweight or obese, or do you mean storing toxic compounds in your fat tissue? I'm not sure what you mean by that question because fat is a storage organ that stores a lot of toxic compounds. So the more toxic exposure you've had over time, fat can definitely, uh, weight loss can mobilize toxins out of your fat and create problems. This is why some people, when they're going initially and they lose a lot of weight, they feel they can feel worse before they feel better. Uh, we call it angry fat. Um, let's see. So my, my cold, I have cold hands and feet for years. This is Lynn's question. A nurse said I should get my thyroid checked. I did. It always comes back low normal. Yeah, I mean, the suggestions I would say, Lynn, is, is, is if your diet's not squared away, the very first thing, I mean, I've just seen this, I've seen going gluten-free counter thyroid problems in so many people over the last 20 plus years. Um, so that would be certainly something I would encourage you to look at because it doesn't cost you anything and it, you know, it's free. Uh, yeah, I would check out No Grain, No Pain, go read my book, follow the 30-day the diet in the book. Uh, and if you know that's free, even if you check it out at the library, you can also get it off of Barnes and Noble or Amazon or any other major book retailer. But um, that's where I would start. Let's see here. Can 100 billion CFU jumpstart your gut? 100 billion colony forming units of probiotics, not a bad start. If, if you really want to jumpstart, like if you're really low, I mean, I look at kind of a starting dose at 200 billion CFUs. We have, we have something, Cheryl, called ultrabiotic defense, which is guaranteed to contain more than 200 billion units on its expiration date. So when it really, when it rolls off the manufacturing line, we, we generally, we have it positioned to be about 400 billion because as, as it sits on a shelf, it, over time, the, the potency starts to diminish. Most probiotics are not, they're not labeled that way. We, we have full disclosure labels, so we, we guarantee the dose of our probiotics based on the expiration date, not best based on the born on date. Whereas most, most manufacturers will tell you how much they're, you're getting is based on their born on date. And that's very misleading. You always wanna, you, you know, because pro, you, could, you, know, you could have 100 billion colony forming units that you think you're getting, but it's been sitting on a shelf for six months and it's deteriorated 50%, so you're actually only getting 50 billion. So I hope that helps you at least a little bit understand that better. Yeah, so Mary says, I found that most doctors test around what your insurance allows. Call the insurance company and tell them why you need to test done. It can help or pay cash to save your life. Yeah, I agree with that. I, I mean, most doctors, 
They do. They order what the insurance company covers, and they'll order more if your insurance company order or approves more. But I, I think that's unethical, and, and I'll tell you why. It's not the doctor's decision to help you manage your budget. It's the doctor's decision to tell you what you need in order to get valid information so you can make intelligent decisions about restoring your health. And to me, it's vastly less expensive to have the data up front and be able to make those meaningful changes than to spend 25 years on a thyroid medication struggling with your health, not knowing what's wrong with yourself because the doctor said your insurance wouldn't cover a test. That's a ridiculous notion. This is your life. This is your health. And so it matters. And uh, doctors shouldn't make that decision, um, at least not in my opinion, not based on what they think you may or may not be willing to afford or are capable of affording. Let's see here. Keep going down on the right. Keep going down on the left. Uh, Melissa says, you said Levo has gluten and dairy. Is there a type of medicine for thyroid that you recommend someone try that does not have gluten, grains, and dairy? Yeah, I mean, there's several. Tyrosent is a, is a, is a version of thyroid medicine that if it, if it matches what your needs are, that could be used or recommended by your doctor. Um, but then there's also, you can get Levo, you just have to get it compounded. So if you do, some people do really better with Levo than they do with, say, Armor or Naturethroid or Tyrosent which are kind of more of your natural versions of thyroid medication. Um, and so they just need to get it compounded to make sure that there's no dairy and no, no corn derivative in it. So that's what I would suggest is if you do really well on, on that, then you, know, you definitely want to get, get the junk out of it. And just ask your doctor to you know, write you a prescription for a compounded version of the same medication. And that, you know, most doctors, it's, all they have to do is pull out their pad and write it. Now, on that same note, I'll also mention something else that I think is very critical to say. Um, if you are on a medicine, thyroid, and, and, and you really need it, and you've experimented, and you've done all the things we talked about tonight, and you still need that thyroid medicine, and you're still struggling, you should be aware of the difference between generic and brand name medicines. Most generics are made here, China and India. Now, there was a really huge expose. It happened right before the start of COVID. There's a really good book. A, a really great investigative journalist wrote a book on this topic called Bottle of Lies. And if you read it, you'll never, ever, ever accept generic drugs again. And it's because the FDA turns, uh, turns their eye to manufacturing major flaws in manufacturing, major violations of manufacturing rules of pharmaceutical drugs occur in a lot of these. So when the FDA inspectors go over to these international uh, uh, factories, they come back with these scathing reports of how the, the facility wasn't clean, how certain areas weren't quarantined properly, how drugs, when they came into the facility, uh, weren't properly handled. Uh, and there's all this risk for potential for contamination of the medicines. This is what generic is made from. So if you remember, there's a number of years ago when, when um, the politicians were saying, we need cheaper drug options for elderly for Medicare. And so they passed this law, this Affordable Drug Act. And so what they really did, what they didn't tell you is they, they didn't tell you they were gonna get your generic drugs from companies who do a really crappy job and an unethical job of producing products, and they were gonna call that the same as the brand name. And brand name is better. As a matter of fact, there's, there, one of the things that when you read this book is certain clinics, certain famous clinics won't use generic because one example I can give you is, is they were using generic drugs to lower their patient's blood pressure and all of a sudden the drugs quit working and the blood pressure levels started going up and these doctors really paying attention found out about this and so they switched only to this because they couldn't trust that and that's the problem we're in is there's this huge ethical so we have this ethics issue right and this is across the board we have this major ethics issue in in in, in outsourcing our products you know to these companies who aren't regulated effectively. You have to understand the FDA can only regulate if it's present 
strong enough and consistently enough to have oversight, but FDA truly doesn't have much oversight because there's too much money involved. And so the, once the money and the politics gets involved, you know, the consumer is the one who gets screwed. Excuse my French, but that's what happens. You guys are the ones that take the brunt of, of the problem here. And so my advice is always go with brand name or go with a compounding pharmacy where they're getting the brand name version to compound it for you, but not taking the generic because the generic, in my opinion, with generics, and I've seen this be the case to my own practice, generics, all bets are off. You, you don't know what you're going to get. You can't even trust that what you think you're getting is what you're getting. And that's one of the problems that so many people are having in these last number of years is as um, more and more generics are hitting the market and, and not being properly regulated. Let's see here. Um, if iodine in testing isn't showing, removing bromine and fluoride, what else can you take to get those out of the thyroid? You've got to you flush it out with iodine. The best way to detoxify from bromine and fluoride is to flush it out with iodine. That's why a lot of people fear iodine that, that have Hashimoto's is when they take iodine, they feel worse. But the actual side effect they're experiencing, you know, if they if they're if they're if they have high levels of bromine or fluoride, is they're experiencing kind of a detoxification reaction where they're pushing that stuff out of their body. And so they're, they're having that symptom. Uh, Epstein-Barr, Kathy asking about Epstein-Barr virus affecting thyroid function. I, look, my experience is that most people overrate what Epstein-Barr does. epstein I mean, if, you, if I tested everybody in this country for Epstein-Barr, we're gonna find that more than 70% of the population have antibodies to Epstein-Barr. Um, it's not to say that Epstein-Barr can't play a role. It's just saying that most doctors, you know, I, I think they put Epstein-Barr on a pedestal. In most cases that I see, Epstein-Barr is not playing the major role in why the thyroid is malfunctioning. And so if you've been told you have, you know, Epstein-Barr, cytomegalovirus, um, you know, any of those types of, of viruses that are super common that you've been exposed to since you were a child, and that's probably really not the case. You probably are either doing your diet wrong or you haven't been thoroughly investigated in terms of the biochemistry. Let's see here. So low TSH, low T3, low T4, high cortisol on 125 micrograms of levothyroxine and 5 micrograms of cytomel. What would I suggest? I would suggest finding a doctor who's capable of doing everything we talked about tonight because if you're on that quantity of medicine and you're still not responding, then you know that's the problem. You, you have, you're being over-medicated, but the medicine's not converting and not working, and you have no idea why, and whoever's giving you that medication also has no idea why, because it's obviously not solving, solving the problem. No amount of medication increase is gonna solve your thyroid problem from an underlying origin issue. You always wanna go and look at the root, and so the things I talked about tonight were most of those roots. Um, and if you start digging there first, you get most of you will get to an answer. If you're on a budget, how can you get tested? Is there a priority for testing? Um, yeah, Colleen, I would say if you're on a budget, and I, you know, I can respect that, especially in these times. If you're on a budget, budget for it is what I would suggest that you do. Don't piecemeal it. If, you, if, you, if I gave you and I said, only do these things here, let's prioritize these things here, but you had a food allergy that was damaging your gut, that was creating nutritional deficiencies, or you had nutritional deficiencies that were damaging your thyroid's ability to produce the chemicals that it's supposed to produce, like you would be chasing your tail for the rest of your life. Like don't piecemeal you can't piecemeal comprehensive, right? I mean, like fundamental things are fundamental for a reason. And these things that I shared with you tonight are fundamental. They, you, you, it would be like saying, hey, I'm going to eat right and I'm going to exercise, but I'm not going to sleep and I expect to be healthy. No, you can't, you can't negotiate with sleep. It's a fundamental. It's a fundamental part of being healthy. And, and so these are fundamental parts of understanding. If you're, again, if you're healthy, you don't need to go spend all this money on this type of testing. But if you're not healthy and you're struggling, budget for it. Like find, find you a good doctor, find out what it's gonna cost you, 
budget for it, and when you do it, do it right. And this is a problem I see all the time. People come to me with piecemealed labs all the time. They want me to interpret labs from last year and the year before and this year. And most of the time, those labs are very non-comprehensive. There are bits and pieces of the complete puzzle. So what you're, this is why that person's still struggling is because uh, th their other doctor has piecemealed their care and not been comprehensive in what, in what they're trying to seek out. Yeah, so what do you suggest if your thyroid medicine continues to be changed due to recalls on potency issues? Yeah, I, I know what you're talking about, all the recalls with the drugs. Get with a good compounding pharmacy and, and, and do your best to stay as consistent as you can. But work, work with your doctor in a compounding pharmacy to try to, to try to make sure that you don't fall prey to some of these recalls that are occurring. I mean, there's not, there's not a perfect answer for that. Let's see here. Do the parathyroid glands have uh, parathyroid glands have in the thyroid metabolism? No, parathyroid glands are predominantly are not your thyroid. They're parathyroid, meaning they're beside your thyroid, and their job, for the most part, is to help regulate your serum calcium and your bone density. Um, which calcium and, and vitamin D play well. It's too much of a topic to get into tonight. Parathyroid is too complex to talk about in ten seconds. Yeah, somebody said, my doctor said he won't work with a compounding pharmacy because of its inconsistencies from batch to batch. Um, you know, I would say that you, you probably need to connect your doctor with a compounding pharmacy, uh, with a really good compounding pharmacist who can have an intelligent conversation with that doctor and get him to change his mind. Otherwise, I'd find a different doctor. Um, I mean, compounding pharmacies exist for a reason because there's, there's needs for specialized medicine. There's needs for specialized and customization within medicine for your doctor to just dismiss all compounding pharmacies, in my opinion, is, is kind of irresponsible. And that would be like saying, hey, I had a bad experience with a plumber a few times. I'm going to dismiss plumbing as a career field. And, and you know, my toilet could be backed up with, with waste dripping into my bedroom, but nope, I'm not going to bring in a plumber uh, who might possibly know how to do something right. That, it doesn't make any sense to dismiss an entire career. It's be like saying, hey, I had a bad experience with a doctor once. Uh, I'm never going to go to a doctor again. It's, re it's a ridiculous notion. Um, get a different doctor or have a conversation with your doctor, talk some sense into that doctor. Oh, let's see, keep going down on both sides. So, I mean, more, more questions about, about um, you know, compounding pharmacies. Look, there's good and bad in any profession. You can have a bad experience with a compounding pharmacy, and you can have a great experience with one. I would say if, you're, if, you, if you found that you struggle with one, call around. Find out who's good. Talk to your friends, family, other people that you might know that, that have experience with a compounder and find a company that you, know, that you feel like you can trust and give them a shot. Yeah, so somebody's asking about, do I do virtual consultation? Yeah, we do virtual consultation. You can call us if you'd like to do that. We, we, you, don't have to, you don't have to fly to Texas. If you don't live in Texas, you can call me. Um, so somebody's asking about the ideal TSH level. It, there's no ideal. It's a myth. I mean, I, what does that mean, ideal? There's a range. 0. 0.5 to 4.5 is generally the range. Why is there a range? Because some people weigh 100 pounds and some people weigh 250 pounds. So the ideal level, when doctors try to tell you, oh, your level should be this or should be that, it's really kind of misleading. It's not about ideal. It's about it's about being within that norm with all of these things. So again, when you're looking at all of these things in comprehension, you don't have to shoot for, you know, some doctors say a functional range is under two, right? And I, I disagree with that. I, I say if you're, if you're a female that weighs 100 pounds, you're not going to produce as much TSH most likely as a man that weighs, you know, 190 pounds or 200 pounds, right? There are differences. There are biochemical individual differences. And so we can't really, we don't really say, okay, what's ideal? That's what that range is designed to help us understand is what, where can we go with this and how do you feel and are you, are you responding? Let's keep going down on the left.
If diagnosed with hyperthyroidism and you don't take meds, you can, um, can you find out the cause eventually? Yeah, I mean, you know, the meds for hyperthyroidism, you know, that's a decision you have to make with your doctor whether or not you want to take those meds. But I've had a number of people with Graves not take the meds and still find the cause. In many cases, the cause was gluten. Gluten and food allergies are common. I see commonly a cause of Graves uh, as an overall uh, is my overall experience. So I've seen a number of people with that condition when they changed their diet, they, they, you know, they didn't need the medicine. Um, is there a certain food allergy type of, so there's, Deborah's asking about food allergy tests. Don't, so the mistake I see most people make is, is, uh, it's more than one test, Deborah. So it's not like, okay, do this test. Um, but, but most people do this test. It's called an IgG test and it's inaccurate and I don't recommend it. If you're doing IgG testing or if your doctor's wanting to run IgG testing for food allergies, you have to understand it's not that simple. IgG can be, you know, you could have IgG antibodies that are helping you, not necessarily hurting you, so it can be misinterpreted. You can also have IgG antibodies that mean there is a true allergy. Most labs don't differentiate between friendly IgG and, and, and um, damaging or hurtful IgG, and that's a big, big part of the problem with why when many people go buy these food allergy tests online, they, they get information that's not really all that helpful. But there's IgA, there's IgG, there's IgM, there's IgE, there's immune complex, there's T cell responses. There's different kinds of immune responses. And this is what I mean. It has to be comprehensive in nature. And that's why it's so important that, you know, I've, what I'm giving you guys is a synopsis. Like I've given you the outline to go and talk with your doctor about, but Look, you don't want an unqualified doctor running tests that they don't know how to interpret and read. And that, that's a big, big part of the problem for many people is they ask their doctor to do things their doctor's not trained on and not capable of, right? You don't go to the OB-GYN and ask them to do, you know, your, your endoscopy and you don't go to your GI doctor and ask them to do a vaginal exam. Like it's, it's not the right match. If you want nutritional evaluation, you need to see somebody who's an expert in nutritional biochemistry. And if that's not what that doctor is, and you're barking up the wrong tree. You're, you're asking a plumber to be an auto mechanic, et cetera, right? You get the gist. So, so again, hire the right person, find the right expert. Okay, I think we've got to wrap it up because we still got, you know, pages of questions left, but, but we're already 27 minutes past the hour. So um, I'm hungry. I'm going to go home and eat dinner. And I hope you do the same thing. And I hope you have a fantastic week. We'll see you next Monday for another episode of Pick Dr. Osborne's Brain. Look, if you're new to the show and you want to get reminders about the show, make sure you come visit me at glutenfreesociety.org. Sign up for our newsletter there. It's right there, right up front and center, very obvious. And you'll get those email reminders. This is also ensure that you don't get censored as we've been targets of major censorship over this last year because we talk about truth. We talk about real health. And that's, that always makes us a target. So... Help me help you. Subscribe so we can communicate, but also share this information, right? Share. Our goal is to save 100 million lives. Just in the U.S. alone, there's 46 million people with autoimmune disease. And our goal is to save 100 million lives. And we know with your help that we'll be able to accomplish that goal. So help me um, help you by sharing and, uh, and caring about other people as well. And together we can do wonders. Have a great evening. We'll see you next Monday for another episode of PDOB. Take care. Hey, don't forget to tune in next week, same time, 6 p.m. Central Standard Time for another Pick Dr. Osborne's Brain Show. Bring all your toughest health questions to me. I look forward to answering them. And before you leave today, make sure you hit subscribe. And once you do, click that bell. That bell is gonna allow us to remind you right before we go live, but it's also gonna allow us to remind you when we come out with other video content all week long. We've got lots of episodes coming your way all week long, and I don't want you to miss anything. So again, subscribe, hit that bell so that you can get notified when we have that new information put up for you. Thanks so much, and I'm wishing you excellent health. Have a great week. We'll see you next Monday night.